Now I'm guessing a number of you did this. How many of you came up with 447 and 12 cents? Good. Well, that's promising then. Because that's the most common mistake that people make is they find 8% of the 46 and they subtract it. The problem is, is if we look at that 8%, 8 over 100, the 8, of course, represents the amount of the tax. The 100 represents the price before tax. The 486 does not represent either of those. The 486 is the price after tax. So how do we represent a percent that represents that 486? Well, it's, it might be, but it's not going to go with 100%. Because we have the price before tax. We're going to add the tax to it, then we're going to get the price after tax. Remember, each item is described by a percent and also by a dollar amount. The amount of the tax is 8%, but the, the percent before tax is the 100%, just as we stated here. And we're given the $486 as the price after tax. So if we add 100 plus 8, the price after tax is 108%. So what we're looking at here, the 486 represents 108%. So 108% 108 is 108 over 100. The 486 has to go with the 108. And now we can cross, multiply, and divide. 100 times 46 divided by 108 is $450. So $450 is the price before tax. We're asked for the amount of tax. So we have to take the 486 minus 450. It's 36 bucks. Yep. And you can't do that because the 8% is not based on the 486. It's based on whatever that price was before the tax. So that's one of, the, one of the things we stressed last week on Wednesday and Thursday. And it's one of the important things, the most common mistake made in these percent problems, is you have to make sure you know what the 100% pairs up with. Because that's what you're basing your calculations off of. In this case, since 486 was the large number in the problem, it was really tempting to pair that with 100%, but it's not. 100% is the starting value before tax, and the 486 already has the tax added into it. So you pretty much just add the percent to the 100. Yep. Add on top over 100. Yep. And then you put whatever number they give you on top. Yeah. Because this was the price after tax, so the tax was full price, which was 100%, plus the 8%. So yes, that has to be 108%. The easiest way for me is I actually, I know this is a little bit of work, but I actually write out that chart. That way I know exactly what matches up with what. So after tax is represented by 108% and the 486 bucks. So I know when I set up my proportion, those two go together. Okay, we had mentioned last week something called the rate method of percents. So far, most of the, the problems we've done have been using that proportion. And we, I like that proportion because one, like I said, I've showed up here, you can label each piece and you know what it's matching up with and it helps you avoid some mistakes by labeling carefully. And the calculations always cross, multiply, and divide. You don't have to worry about, do I multiply, do I divide, or do I move the decimal point before or after, or any of that. The rate method of percents, we said, was really useful when we knew what the 100% was, 
and we're going to find a piece of that using a percent. For example, let's say that we are told 2% of parts are defective. and 4,500 parts were produced. If I want to find out how many defective there are, well, I could just take my 4,500 times 0 0.02 for the 2%, which is going to give me 90 defective parts. which is not a bad calculation. It was because we knew we were starting out with the whole amount and we were using the percent to find a piece. Most often we stick to some set problems where we know that's going to be the case. For example, some of you may end up being in a sales position. And sometimes when you work sales, you work off a commission. What a commission is, is you get your pay is a percentage or a portion of your sales. Now there's something called straight commission. In a straight commission or pure commission, that is the only pay you get is a percentage of your sales. So let's say you get 12% of sales is your commission. So in a week, where your sales are, are let's go $4,300. Your commission is just the $4,300 times 12% is 0.12. What is that, $512? No, $516. Is that better, 516? So your commission is 516 bucks. Now, not too many jobs go off straight commission anymore. Um, federal labor laws have adjusted in the last 20 years. Um, they require the minimum wage. There used to be exceptions 20 years ago or so to that minimum wage where you, know, you could do performance-based pay. Now you have to prove that your employees will, on average, get enough in their performance to, to clear at least the minimum wage per hour. Like for waiters and waitresses, uh, it was minimum wage, like two dollars and thirty-five cents, or something like that. But you have to get permission to pay that. What that means is you actually have to show the state that, on average, your your staff makes enough tips to guarantee what is it, seven dollars and some, seven twenty-five for minimum wage now. Um, I should know that, but I haven't followed minimum wage for a while. Like you have to report out your tips. Yes. And then we have to multiply it by a certain number to, depending on what we claim for the two tips or for the five. Yes. So does that mean the employer is kind of cheating the system? Or? No, no, as long as they're doing it honestly. If, you know, employers who don't report tips, a lot of times they'll get in trouble and they'll have to pay minimum wage. That's why a lot of employers are very, very strict about their wait staff reporting tips so that they can pay the smaller wage. And there are several several um, establishments in this area that I know of that have been forced to pay, you know, four or five bucks an hour instead of the two thirty-five because they can't prove it. And they did the same thing with commission-based. Uh, if you're a sales and you're doing commission-based, you have to prove that your your employees are going to, on average, make at least that minimum wage. So a lot of times, what they do now is either a salary plus.
commission or a wage plus commission. Salary plus is a little simpler. For example, a salary plus might be they were going to pay you $300 per week plus 6% of sales. Notice it's a smaller percentage now. So let's say in a week where your sales are $5,200. Let's figure out what your pay is. Well, first thing we have to do is take your 5,200 times what? 0 0.06, which is what, 312? $312 is your commission, plus your 300 base is going to be $612. Or uh, many of the positions in this area are hourly, so they're wage plus commission. So you might get paid... $7 per hour plus, you know, 7%. So on a week where you worked 30 hours and had sales of $5,800. Well, your sales, let's do that first. 5,800 times the 0 0.07 is going to give us what? Four oh six for commission. And then we have to do our hours as well. Thirty hours times seven dollars per hour is two hundred and ten dollars for your wages. So that gives you a total of six hundred and sixteen dollars for the week. So that's one way of doing a salary plus or a wage plus. A lot of places do kind of a conditional. Like your salary plus, they might give you $250 a week plus 9% on sales over $3,000. So what they're saying is they're expecting you to get some sales for that $250 a week. And then anything you go over that, they'll give you a commission on. So let's say we have a week where sales are $6,100. To figure out their commission, where do we start? Do we do the 6100 times 0.09? We've got to subtract the 3000 first. Very good. So we're only going to get paid commission on 3100 of that. Times 0.09 is what, $279? The $279 plus the wage of $250. So it's $529 for the week. The wage plus, if they do it like that, is a lot more complicated. And I'm not going to confuse you with it. But what they would do is they would, because obviously somebody who works 20 hours a week compared to someone who works 30 hours a week, there should be a different base. So what they do is they do it as uh, you get paid the commission on so much above so much for sales per hour instead of just sales for the week. So it can be kind of complicated. They do sometimes have what's called a graduated scale. Kind of an extra incentive to, to work harder and sell more. Um, they might have, let's say, zero to five thousand dollars is going to get paid at eleven percent. Everything over five thousand dollars might get paid at sixteen percent commission. So if you have a week. We'll call it week one where sales is 4,800 bucks. 
How do we figure out your commission? Well, it's just 4,800 times 0 0.11, 11%. $528. Let's say that week two, you have sales of 6,200. Now that has to be split up. The first 5,000 is at 11 percent. How much do we go above 5,000? 1,200 dollars. 6,200 minus 5,000 is 1,200. That's going to get paid at 16 percent. So 5,000 times 0.11 is 550. 1,200 times 0 0.16, 192. Most of the time, no. They just give you the commission on what's over that amount, the extra commission. No, they don't just give you the 16% on everything. At least not in most cases. Now there's all sorts of uh, incentive programs with these commissions, by the way. Some of them, if you reach a goal one week, they give you an extra 1% commission or whatever the next week. And there's all sorts of different combinations you can get into with this. And I don't want to get that detailed in commissions. But I do want to show you something called a draw. And the reason I want to show it to you is because even though it's not as common as it was back in the 90s, it's still out there and it's really kind of tricky. It can, it can be alluring, it can seem attractive and draw you in, but you can end up being trapped with it. Um, I'm going to just use some old examples. The main place that you saw this applied was in the insurance industry. And it was very common for a place they would offer 12% commission with a guaranteed $800 weekly draw. That sounds pretty good. Eight hundred dollars a week, that's forty thousand a year. That's a decent decent paycheck. But what it sounds like is that they're guaranteeing you eight hundred dollars a week, and they kind of are. But let's look at how that happens. So let's say in week one we have sales of forty two hundred dollars. The amount of commission on that $4,200 is going to be times 0.12 by 12%, which is what, $504? How much are you going to get paid? Oh, $800. Guaranteed $800 minimum weekly draw. Well, what we have there, though, is you only earned $504. 296 of that to get you up to the 800 is considered a draw. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'll show you in a minute. Let's say week two, you're getting a little bit better. Sales up to $5,100. Times 0.12 gives you $612 commission. You're going to get paid $800. Well, you had $612. You got paid $800. So the other $188 of that is a draw. That now puts your total draw up at $482. No, $84.
That's just by adding those two numbers together. So third week. Let's say your sales are now up to $6,300. Times 0 0.12 gives us 756. 756. Well, you're going to get paid 800. Well, you had 756. The other $44 is a draw, part of that draw. That now adds up to $528 that you've taken on draw. So let's say in week four, you finally get up to speed. You hit 8,000 in sales. Times 12% or 0.12 is $960 in commission. How much are you going to get paid? Why only 800? You made 960. That extra 160 goes to pay back on the draw. That draw is not free. It's actually a loan. So you, you have to pay it back. When your commissions get greater than that minimum draw, you do have to pay back until you get paid even. For example, let's say in week five, they have 15,000 in sales, just, just so we can wipe out that draw. So times 0.12, that's, eighteen hundred commission right eighteen hundred dollars in commission what they're going to get for pay they're going to get that eighteen hundred minus the three sixty eight so that's fourteen hundred and thirty two dollars and now their draw is down to zero it's wiped out I don't get it. So they, don't get their commission? they do get their commission but the company is guaranteeing them a minimum of eight hundred dollars a week but since it's not an $800 a week minimum salary, it's an $800 a week draw. And what a draw is, is actually a revolving loan. So here they only made $504. They paid them $800, but that $296 is considered a loan. It has to be paid back when they can. So like the employee only gets a check back for They'll get the full $800. Nope. They've only earned 504. What happens is they get 800, but that 800 includes the 504 that they earned and $296 of draw. So the company is loaning them $296 to get their total check up to 800. So that's what, what happened down here then is when they got to their commission where they made $960 in commission. They could have got the whole 960, but they owed $528 yet on that draw. So they had to pay back on that. That's why down here they finally did get more than that minimum 800 because they had enough commission they could pay back the draw. That's what this 368 was, was paying back the last of the draw. And then they whatever was left, they got that commission. So as long as their commission stays above $800, they're going to get their full commission. If it drops below $800, they're still going to get $800, but eventually they're going to have to pay back that difference. And I've seen this happen to people before where they get, and they said it's mostly in the insurance industry, but I have seen it happen where they get into that position, they work for six or eight months, and they realize that sales just isn't for them, and they go to leave, but they owe like seven or $8,000 back on that draw because they haven't made the commissions to cover it, and they've been drawing three, 400 bucks a week above their commission. And so now, they, yeah, they're stuck there. They either have to pay it back or they have to stay working there. It is, but it was, uh, they, have, uh, they have regulated this a lot now. It's not what it was 20 or 25 years ago, where it was very, very common. Because a lot of people that got into those situations claim they didn't realize that's what it was. So now it has to be made way more clear up front when you sign on with a company that that's how it's done. But you hear that term draw, be very careful. Okay, 
Another application where this rate method of percents works really nice is for interest. And we're actually going to start out talking about simple interest. So for simple interest, the formula is I equals P times R times T, where I is the dollar amount of the interest. P is what's called the principal. That's the starting amount. Yep. Yeah. Well, you got to be careful saying how much you get because there are two types of a loan. There's a simple interest bearing note. And in a simple interest bearing note, you would get the principal. And then there's something called a simple discount note. And in a simple discount note, the principal or the face value is the amount that you pay back at the end. Like you can get a $1,000 simple discount note. $1,000 is how much you're going to pay back. So they figure out what the interest would be and subtract it off. Let's say it's going to be $200 in interest, so they're going to give you, or turn it up. Yeah, $200 in interest. So they'll give you $800, and at the end you pay back the thousand. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think the maximum interest you can charge in Wisconsin right now is 36%, but that's still ridiculous. Yep. Yep. It sounds about right because most of them are done on a six month schedule and yep. Yep. Yeah, those payday loan places have like a twenty percent default rate, but they still make money. So about one in five people don't pay them back, but they still make money. So if that gives you any idea of how high their interest rates are. Not necessarily anybody, but they'll improve people with pretty bad credit, pretty high risk. So R is the rate, and the rate is just the decimal form of a percent. And T is your time, and time is always given in years. So let's take a look at this. So we're asked to find the simple interest on a $3,500 loan at 8% two years. So the simple interest is going to be I equals PRT. I is what we're looking for here. That's the amount of the simple interest. What's P? Principal. So 3500 bucks. Very good. What is R? The rate, the 8%, so it's going to be 0 0.08 because the, the percent is a decimal. And T, two years, so times two. So, what is that, 560 bucks? That's the interest. Now, if I wanted to know how much is going to be paid back, That's something that's called the maturity value.
the maturity value is equal to the principal plus the interest. So here that would be the $3,500 plus the $560. So $4,060. The most common as far as... Um, it all depends on the setting. This is probably the most common as far as your average consumer. Um, the discount notes, like treasury bonds and corporate bonds are discount. Um, a lot of uh, business loans can be discount depending on the collateral. Those examples, we're not going to get into discount notes just because those examples get pretty complex. Now it is not terribly common to have a simple interest note for two years. Generally, simple interest is only used on things that are you know, six months or less. If it's more than six months, they usually use something called compound interest, which we'll look at that in the second hour today. That's where they figure out the interest every so often and they add it into the account. And then in the next period, you get interest on top of that interest. So it's very beneficial if you're the investor. Uh, if you're the one loaning the money, it's very beneficial. If you're the one that has to pay the money back, it costs you more. What is it where you have a loan, like say the house loan or something with the mortgage, like a little extra one month, but you have two years? How is that allowed to charge the principal, not the The next payment? Yeah. That's just a principal payment is all it is. Does it help or Um, there's a lot of variables in that situation. If you're the person who's paying back the loan, if you can afford to pay a little bit extra, it will really cut off how much interest you pay total, depending on what the percentage rate is. When there are people out there right now that have auto loans, have car loans at like 1.9%, well, paying an extra 20 or 30 bucks a month on those isn't going to really do you a whole lot of good because you're getting the money at 2%. If there's some place else where you're paying higher, you know, higher interest rates, it would make sense. Like if you're on a credit card where you're paying, you know, 24% or 19% minimum, you know, usually. Uh, if you want to, if you're just making the minimum payments and paying an extra 20 or 30 bucks a month there, it makes a big difference on how fast you pay it down. Um, same with a home mortgage. A home mortgage, a lot of people have home mortgages right now for 3.5%. Paying a few extra bucks a month there can shave a few years off of your mortgage. So I'm not saying it isn't worth it, but again, that's money you're getting cheap. If you're old money at higher interest or you're, if you've got investments where you're making more than that, then it doesn't pay to, to pay off that loan. So say like say you got high interest rates, yes. If the interest rate on the loan is higher than what you're earning on your money and your investments, if you're somebody who just sticks your money in the bank in a savings account where you're only gonna make like a quarter of a percent interest, well, then, yeah, it makes sense to pay off your loans. Um, the other thing is, is if, like I said, if you have that extra money, if you're somebody who scrapes by from month to month, and this month you just happen to have an extra 50 bucks, it makes more sense to put it away as a cushion just in case next month you're $20 short. So you can use that money to, to make up the difference. <clears throat> Okay, so like I said, most of the time, they're not going to do simple interest on a two-year loan. So let's take a look at what would happen on a shorter one. Let's say you borrow $2,000 at 9% for three months. I used to do this a lot. Run a construction business, and every now and then you'd get to the point it's time to pay your employees, but you haven't finished a job, so you haven't been paid from the customer yet, and you don't have the cash to make your payroll. So you go to the bank and say, Hey, I've got this money coming in, I just need a couple of months, and they'll give you a loan like this. Usually a little bit higher rate, like the 9%. But how do we figure out the interest there? 
Well, the principal is 2,000. The rate, 9%, so 0.09. Three months. We said the time was always expressed in years. So three months is going to be 3 twelfths of a year. So 2,000 times the 0 0.09. Now, you do have a fraction key on most of your calculators, but for these, it's easier just to go times 3 divided by 12. That way, it stays as a decimal and doesn't throw your answer into a fraction. This one comes out to be an even 45 bucks anyway. So $45 interest, which means at the end, your maturity value is the 2,000 plus the 45. So you would have to pay back $2,045. It isn't terrible, but I mean, that's only for two months. I mean, that $45 is definitely worth it to, to not upset your employees. Okay. Well, how about this? There's the one thing that does shock people is a couple of places where simple interest is used where you wouldn't expect it because everybody thinks it's compound interest is on home mortgages and car loans. The thing with simple interest is that interest is only calculated Calculated and added to the account in one of two cases. One, at the end of the time, the maturity in other words, or two, whenever there's an action on the account. An action is usually a payment into the account or a withdrawal out of the account. Well, with a, a home mortgage or a car loan, what has to happen every month? You have to make a payment. So every time you make a payment, the interest is calculated in before that payment is credited to your account. So those actually are done with simple interest. Um, one of the consequences of that that shocks most people is if you make several payments, let's say on a car loan, you get your tax refund, so you want to pay a couple of months ahead. You know, some banks are really touchy about that, by the way. Some banks won't let you make more than one or two payments ahead of schedule. But let's say you, you do, you have a bank that will let you pay ahead, so you get your, your tax refund or whatever, and you make your next four car payments. So you don't have to make a car payment for four months. So you don't. So you sit there for four months, and then in four months you have, it's time to make a payment, so you make a payment. But what has happened is you made those four payments all at once. They figured in the interest that was due, then they made those four payments. But now for four months, that money is sat there and the interest has not been calculated. So when you make that payment in four months, the interest gets calculated on that whole length of time. So you get a really large interest charge. Now, it's not a big deal. You actually do save money. In fact, why not do that example? What the heck, right? Nope. Um, depends on the bank. Some banks only allow you to pay two months ahead, and then any further payments get applied straight to the, the principal. Other banks, like my bank, allows me to pay ahead as far as I want to. My next car payment is not due until July of 2018. But whenever I get a bonus check for uh, some of my other jobs, I put it towards my car loan so that I don't have to worry about it. I will make payments before then, but yes, if I wait three or four months, there's going to be a huge interest. In fact, if you wait too long, there's a chance that what you pay won't even cover the interest.
Well, here, let me show you what I mean. Let's say I have a balance of $12,000. And your monthly payment, just to keep it simple, is $300. So over here, we're going to assume that includes all the interest up until that point. You pay... 300 times 4 or $1,200. So that's now $10,800 is the balance, right? Well, in four months, bless you, let's say this is 8% interest. So in four months, and we're just going to assume that that's 4 over 12, the amount of interest due. It's going to be the 10,800 times 0 0.08 times 4 twelfths. Oops, wrong button. So $288 in interest. So when you go to make that next payment, that next $300 payment, what they're going to do is they're going to add that $288 to that balance. So it's actually going to be $11,088. Then they're going to subtract that $300. Bucks. So your balance is going to be $10,788. You made that payment, it only reduced your balance by $12 bucks because you had that much interest built up. So the question is, is it worth it to do that? Well, yeah, let's show you what happens if you don't do it that way, if you just pay it every month. You pay it every month. So in month one, you paid your $300. You're at $11,700. We're assuming that's just making one payment here instead of the four payments, right? In our second month, we have to pay interest. So our interest is going to be the $11,700 times 0 0.08 times one month. which gives us $78 in interest. We add that on, so that's $11,778. Then we subtract the 300, so now it's $11,478. That's after the second month. The third month, take the $11,478 times 0 0.08 times 1 12th, gives us $76.52 in interest. So I'm going to add that on here. So it's $11,554.52 minus your $300 payment. So it's $11,254.52. In the fourth month, that would be the last of these original four payments that you had made all at once before. So in month four, take the 11, 254.52 times 0 0.08 times 1 12th again to get your interest. This is going to be $75.03. And interest. So I'm going to add that on here. So $11,329.55. And you made your $300 payment. So that's $11,029.55. Now in the fifth month, that's, that's where this last payment over here was made in the fifth month. You ended up with that balance after the fifth payment. 
So in our fifth month, we're going to take that $11,029.55 times 0 0.08 times 1 12th. Yes. Here, I'll show you here in just a second. So at the $73.53, so we're going to add that on. So that's your balance before the payment. You make the $300 payment. You're now at $10,803.08. So you are still... $15 ahead by making all those payments up front. It just it doesn't look like it because you get you made that next payment and most of the payment went to interest. You only got $12 towards your principal. You're still money ahead though by making those four four payments all at once. Because that's $1200 you made in payments. That's $1200 that you didn't pay interest on for those next few months. Yep. All payments are considered principal and interest. So yes, every payment is broke down. Um, some some banks, what they do is rather than doing it like this and adding the 753 to the balance before you make the payment, what they'll do is they'll just say, hey, you have $729. You make a $300 payment, $73.53 goes towards interest. And the other $226.47 goes to the principal. It ends up, with, you'd end up with the same balance. It's just a different way of writing it on the piece of paper is all. You get every sort of things in a row for a certain amount of time. You're able to just figure out the interest, total interest for the entire loan. And every time you make your payment, they, they, take it, they make it go towards the interest only until it's paid off. That used to be very common. They would figure out the second you the second you started the loan, they figured out what the interest for the life of the loan was. They just added that to the loan, and that was your loan amount, and you just had to pay that amount. And once your total payments hit that amount, you were done paying off the loan. They have uh, regulated against that. You can still do it, but it's just more difficult to do. They've regulated it now to where they have to, again, kind of like the draw on your commission. It has to be made very clear up front that that's how it's being done. Because a lot of people were getting into that, and they were went to pay off their loans early, and they realized it didn't save them any money to pay it off early because they still had to pay the full amount. Is that why some redeeming credit cards, they make it a point where it says no penalty for early payments? Yes, very much so. And that's something that you know most states have regulated that that you cannot penalize someone for paying early. Well, what it does though is it it it's, takes away interest that the bank could be earning from you. A bank doesn't want you to pay off early. They want you to pay off. They don't want you to not pay them because then they they lose out. But they want you to pay off as slowly as possible so they can draw as much interest off you as possible. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's how they make their money. Okay, it is time for a break, so let's go ahead. Okay, so let's take a peek at this problem. They wanted you to find the percents here from the fraction. So we've got 4 and 2 sixteenths, and we want to convert that into a percent. Well, the easiest way to do this, that's really a poor worded problem, by the way. 2 sixteenths really should have been just stated as 1 eighth. But let's... I would change it into a decimal. 4 and 2 sixteenths is 4.125. Now I can make it a percent by just going two spots over. That's 412.5%. All they're asking for. Or you could have done this. You could have made the 4 and 2 sixteenths. You do 4 times 16 is 64 plus 2 is 66 sixteenths. How much is that out of 100? And cross multiply and divide. 66 times 100 is 6600. 66 times 100 is 6600. Divide by 16 is 412.5. The next one. 
4 and 3 16 well, you do this exact same way. 4 and 3 16 Well, 4 times 16 is 64, plus 3 is 67 16 So I'll do the same thing. 67 16 So how much out of 100? 67 times 100 is 6,700. Divided by 16 is... Oh, what is that? 418.25%. Me? I'm I'm tired, so I the internal calculator is not running real sharp this morning. 0.75? Okay. There we go. Okay. That's all they were asking. Yep. Let's talk about compound interest. So compound interest is where rather than waiting till something happens or that there's an action like a payment or a withdrawal or the end of a loan. Compound interest is where every now and then they're going to figure out the interest and add it in. So we're going to compare. We're going to start out with an example of simple interest and we're going to compare it to the compound interest. So we're going to start out with simple interest. We're going to look at, we're going to borrow $5,000 at 8% for three years. So what that means is at the end of the three years, well, first we have to find your interest. What's the principal? 5,000. Your rate? 8%, so 0.08. And three is in years again, so we just put in three. That's going to be $1,200 in interest. So at the end, your maturity value is 5,000 plus 1,200 or $6,200 is your ending balance. The ending balance. Yeah, it is simply your principal plus your interest. That's, com or that's simple interest. What if we compound it? So compound interest, same example. Only now we're going to borrow $5,000 still. It's at 8%. Only we're going to say it's 8% compounded quarterly for three years. Well, you're thinking about the table. If we're just going to do the formulas, Compounded quarterly means four times a year, or every one-fourth or one-quarter of a year. So if we look at that, how many quarters are there going to be in three years? Twelve. So let's look at the first quarter. Find the interest. And then the balance. So in the first quarter, the interest... Is going to be 5,000 times the 0 0.08 times one quarter, which is going to be what, 100 bucks? Um, yeah, that would work for this one. Not always, no. Not always. So I'm going to add the 5,000 and the 100 to get an ending balance of 5,100. In quarter two, my interest is 5,100 times 0 0.08 times one quarter. Well, that's going to be, what, $102? Right? So that means our balance is... $5,100 plus $102. So $5,202 is now our balance. 
quarter, you can see they already got $2 more interest because of the, the previous interest being added in. Quarter three. So it's going to be $5,202 times 0 0.08 times 1 fourth. That's going to be what, $104.04, I believe. So we add the 5202 plus the 10404. $5,306.04. How many times would we have to do this to get to three years? 12 times. There's 12 quarters in three years. I don't want to do this 12 times. I'm a little bit lazy, and there's got to be a better way. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to those percent increase problems we looked at at the end of class last week and the beginning of class today. If I look at this right here, this is 8% times 1 fourth. That's 0.02 or 2%. So each quarter is adding 2%. So we've got the balance at the beginning of the quarter. We're adding in the interest to get the balance at the end of the quarter. We're starting out with 100%. We're adding 2% each quarter, which means at the end of the quarter, we're at 102%. Does that make sense? So the ending balance at each quarter is 102% of what you started with. Like for the first quarter, I could have taken the, the $5,000 and 102% is 1.02. That gives me 5,100. That was my ending balance at the end of the first quarter. I could do that again. I could take that 5,100 times 1.02 again, and I would end up getting $5,202. That was my ending balance at the end of the second quarter up there. So what's happening is each quarter I'm multiplying by the 1.02. That's 100% plus the 2% interest. Gives me my ending balance. How many times would I have to do that to get through three years? Still 12 times. But in math, we have a mechanism for multiplying by the same number over and over again. It's power. So this is 5,000 times 1.02 to the power of 12. Oops, I got 5, I mean 02. Now compare that to what we got with the simple interest, which was 6200 You got an extra $141.21 for compound interest. An extra that you're paying because of the compound interest. Because it was 6200 for simple interest. When we did the simple interest example up here, it was 6200 Always going to get more interest, yes. So really the compound interest or simple interest was $1,200. Our compound interest, if we take this and subtract 5,000, our compound interest paid $1,341.21. I just subtracted that ending balance minus the beginning balance of 5,000. Well, the beginning percent is 100%. And you had 8% times one quarter of a year. It gave you 2% per quarter. So it was 100% plus 2%. That meant at the end of each quarter, you had 102% of what you started with. So we made that into a rate since 102% is multiplying by 1.02. Yes. 108 then for every year, yes. If it was done every year. If it was done monthly, you'd take the 8% divided by 12, so it would be 100 plus that number, so 1.00666667. Um, if you... Well, let's do this. Let's look at it, this the power of this compound interest. How many of you in here are under the age of 25? One of you? You are? Where are you at, Dylan? 28, so you're about the same range. So let's just do that. Let's put kind of average out. Let's do 27 years old. If 
you are 27 years old, now right now you're in school. Um, some of you I know are working full time. But let's say you're, you're, you're living cheaply to get through school because you have to pay for school and whatever and you can't work as much as you'd want to because you have to spend time in school. A lot of people, they get done school, they get that next job that's paying better than what they were making. They want to get a new car or move into a nicer apartment or whatever. But let's say you decided to stay where you were at, live the way you had been living to get through school, stay in that smaller apartment, drive that old car for a while, and just save money. In a year, do you think it would be difficult to put away four or $5,000? Probably not. Well, true, you're going to have school loans in there, too. Um, but for the most part, if you stay living cheaply, like a lot of people are living pretty cheaply to get through school. If you stay living cheaply like that, you can save a decent amount of money. Now, the reason I use $5,000 is that's what the government says you can put. In fact, they bumped it up. I think it's 5500 now this year that you can put away in IRAs and get tax benefits for it. Well, let's just say you put away $5,000 at 27 years old. And retirement age, does anybody know what minimum age to draw Social Security is? It Right now it is 67 years old, which is 40 years away. Um, and actually, that's only if you're above 57 or something like that. They said for every month you're born, I don't remember, it was like 1960-something. Every month you're born, or every year you're born, after that year, your date gets pushed back a month. So I'm 68 something before I can draw full social security. So for you guys, it might be close to 70 years old before you can draw social, full social security. Possibly, who knows? Hopefully they've done something to make it a little bit stronger by then. So anyway, that's 40 years. If you do investment, um, the average annual gain for a 40 year investment is between 12 and 13 percent per year. So a lot of people think, oh, rates are down, you only get like three or four percent interest. Not if you invest right. So let's be conservative and say you're getting 10 percent per year. So that means, and we're only going to compound our interest, compound it yearly, once a year. So if it's 10 percent interest, that means at the end of the year you've got 110 percent of what you had at the beginning of the year. So it's times 1.10. That's 110 percent to the power of 40 because it's 40 years. Now, before you see this answer, does anybody want to guess at how much this is going to be? $226,296. I'm not going to bother with the cents for now. That one $5,000 payment you made at 27 years old turns into $225,000 in your retirement. Yep. Throughout the history of the stock market, which is like 150 some years, every 40 year period, even 40 year periods that contain the Great Depression in the 1930s, 19, late 20s and 30s, the average annual gain is between 12 and 13 percent. Now, within that, there, there are some years in there where they lose 30%, other years where they gain 45 or 50%. But it averages out over every 40-year period you look at between 12 and 13%. So 10% is not, not really an unattainable thing. It's actually a pretty reasonable rate. That's why you go to an prof investment professional and have them help you out. It costs you a little bit of money, but... Much better that way. Well, let's look at that. 40 years average inflation right now is about 1% a year. Yep. So in 40 years, what figure about $30,000 would get you through a year right now? Possibly. 35, 40, what do you want to? 
100,000. 32,000. So times 1.01, because that's 1% .01, inflation, to the power of 40. So 32,000 would cost you about 47, 48,000 in 40 years. So 48,000 would be the same as 32,000 now. So that's still, you know, five years or so worth of, of your living expenses. Let's say you wait till you're 37. Now it's only going to be for 30 years. We're going to assume you can still average 10%. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> That's a safe bet. Comes with about 87 to 47. About one third. A little bit more than one third is what's left. How about you, and this is a mistake a lot of people make. When you're young, you don't really think about retirement, right? You don't think about retirement until you're mid to late 40s. So let's say you wait till you're 47. You're screwed. <laughs> so you got 5,000, you only got 20 years now. You're only going to get 33,637. So this person here who starts at 47 ends up with about one seventh as the person who started at 27. Now let's roll back the clock. Let's say you, you go even younger yet. Let's say you can start at 22. So now it's going to be 45 years. This makes way more difference than most people realize. 364, 452. If you start a baby off, you put $5,000 in the bank for a baby when the, the day they're born. We can do that. 5,000 times 1.1 to the power of 67. That is about $2.9 million in the retirement account at 67. <laughs> it, it takes about $2,000. Put away two thousand dollars, you can guarantee him to pretty much guarantee him to be a millionaire at sixty-seven. You know, a lot of people kind of want to wait till they're kids until they're like finish college. I used to make this argument with people. Here, let's do this. I'm going to show you this example just because it, I think it's so worthwhile to see. I'm going to put in your age. Um, savings balance. Let's start you out at 21. And we're going to go up to 67. Maybe not 107. Huh? <laughs> 67. Putting that 5,000 a year. So now this isn't the $5,000 once, this is $5,000 a year. End up with over $4 million. $67. What's that? Well, maybe not. $4 million might not buy you an island, but... No, and I haven't. Really? Yeah. 
Now, I want to do this. This person here gets out of college, they're 21 years old. They decide, okay, I'm going to live with, keep living with my parents or whatever, I'm drive my old car for a while. I'm going to save money. They get to be 29 and they say, you know what? It's time. I'm going to start playing with my money. So they saved money here for nine years, eight years, and now they're just going to play with their money for the rest of their life. Not going to save another penny. How much do you think they're going to have? Still $2.3 million. This person over here gets out of college and says, darn it, I want a new truck. And I want to move into a nicer place. And spends all their money for the next eight years. Then at 29, they start worrying about saving. What do you think they're going to have at 67? Significantly less. 300,000 less. Almost 350,000 less. That first eight or nine years of your life, starting now, whatever age you are, is more valuable to your retirement than the rest of your life after that. This person over here saved for eight years. This person here saved for 39 years. And you see who came out ahead. Because this person saved for eight years. Now the, the big thing is you got to resist the temptation to tap into it. you got to be able to leave it there for 40 years until you use it. I'm for well you can you can set it up like that but the, the bank can't deny you that money but they can charge you penalties for drawing it out yeah that's really the most they can do is charge you penalties for drawing it out they can't say no you can't have your money now you talked about parents saving for their kids college and I've been called some names for this one. Well, because it seems a little bit cold at first. Well, let's say your your kid's like 15 or 16 years old and you've saved like nine or 10, let's say $10,000 you've saved for their college. My advice is don't let them use it to pay for college. Now that sounds cruel, but Starting at age 16, you are allowed to put money into a retirement account for your child. The condition is you cannot put in more. They have to have a job, and you cannot put more into that retirement account than what they earned that year. So let's say at 16, your kid has a part-time job, and they only make $1,800. So you can put $1,800 in that account for them. Let's say at 17, they earn a little bit more, so they make $2,400. 18, they might make $3,200. Now, so far, you've only put $5,600, $7,400 away for them out of that $10,000 you saved up. So each year, you can keep putting that away as long as they keep working. Let's say they make $2,900. Well, $2,600 would be the, the rest of that. So let's say they make enough. You put away the rest of the $2,600 in the fourth year. One thing, first of all, retirement savings does not count against your financial aid. So this, this money now, once it's in retirement accounts, will not count against your financial aid, so you're still fully eligible for financial aid. If you have it in an account for college, it counts against your financial aid and it reduces your financial aid. So chances are, by having this in retirement accounts, you're going to get more financial aid, so you get more free money. But let's look at what this $10,000 does to their retirement. They have a million dollar retirement sitting there. So basically your kid's retirement, a million dollars they should be able to retire off of even in 40 years. You've, you've Basically you've provided for your child's retirement. Even if they have to get student loans to go through school, they've got the rest of their life to pay back those student loans. What are the chances that they would be committed enough once they got out of college to start saving for retirement? not as big of a chance. The student loans, it's more likely they'll pay those back because they get that bill to pay it back every month. Is there a way you can do a trust account? Like, once you put the retirement account kind of as like under trust or like... Yes, you can. You have to have... Uh, 25, but typically you got to... Um, there's 25, 29. There are certain ages you can... 
set up trust for it. And I know there's an age you cannot go past unless the child is mentally, well, incompetent. It's, well, whether it's disability or some other issue, um, they can be declared incompetent of their own affairs other ways too. But. Right. Well, you can't guarantee though your child's not going to touch it before they retire. No, you can't guarantee it, is but... You can say they can't touch it till a certain age. They like said you can put it in like that's what she was saying. Della was saying you put it in a trust account, so they can't. Um, I don't believe you can go to seventy unless there's extenuating circumstances. They like said unless they have some sort of condition that makes them incompetent. But I know you can go to twenty-five, and I think you can go to twenty-nine for certain types of things. Twenty-five. Well, at twenty-five, that would be twenty thousand dollars sitting there. Um, at that point, it's their choice. Now, there's a lot of different retirement products out there. One of them's a Roth IRA. I use the Roth IRA as my emergency fund because a Roth IRA you can draw out the principal. Let's say I put five thousand dollars in there this year. And in four years, I have an emergency and I need money. I can take out that original $5,000. I just can't touch the interest that it earned. That has to stay in there. I, but I can take out my original $5,000 with no penalties. So it's you know, it's versatile that way, too. So what are you talking about? Like, your bank? Um, you can go to banks. Most banks are going to be more conservative and not give you a higher... You know, better investments. I um, mean, go like I know, and I don't want to like plug anybody. Just go in the yellow pages in the phone book and look under financial advisors. Um, I know State Farm Insurance Company does it. There's Edward Jones in town. There's Fidelity. The biggest question I don't. You should talk to Hugh Harris, who does a lot of the finance classes. He'd be able to tell you more. The biggest question is you ask him, Are you considered my employee? Or are you considered an employee of the company? because the laws are very different on how they behave. If they're considered an employee of the company, they get paid through commission and they're looking to maximize their commission. So they're looking, they're, they're basically trying to sell you a product. If they're your employee and you're paying them out of your pocket to advise you, then they have to advise you on what they think is gonna earn the most money for you. Well, usually the first thing they do is find an attorney. Yes. Handle the taxes. You would think so, yeah. But yeah, most of them, the first thing they do is hire an attorney for you know, taxes and also to protect it so that people can't, as soon as you uh, win the lottery, people are going to try to make claims that you owe all money. And, you know. Um. It depends on which lottery. I know like the Mega Bucks, you cannot stay anonymous. And the Powerball, I don't think you can stay anonymous. I just want to win a lot of money and go under a lot. Yeah. Well, somebody told me once, the best thing to do if you find out you win the lottery before you cash in your ticket and identify yourself, call up all your friends and tell them you need to borrow like 200 bucks because you're behind on your bills. And see which ones try to help you out and which ones basically tell you to get lost. So then you know who your real friends are. <laughs> there is a new quiz that's due tomorrow. That is Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. There's new homework. It's going to be due Wednesday. Wednesday we're going to review for the test. Thursday is our test, test three. The compound interest won't be. The simple interest formula might be. Commission and interest might be on there. There's no area.